Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Berg, and I run the National Security Program here. It's with great pleasure that I uh, get to welcome Colonel Pete Mansour, the author of a stunning new book, The Surge, which is going to be one of the key books about the Iraq War. Uh, deep, deep research, uh, and of course, General uh, Colonel Mansour was there for uh, so much of the key events that he describes in the book. So it's both a real history, but also with an element of memoir. Uh, Colonel Mansour is also a professor at Ohio State. Uh, he was executive officer to General Petraeus. Uh, he has a PhD. Uh, he holds the Raymond uh, Mason Chair in Military History at Ohio State. So we're really pleased to have you here, sir. And uh, after uh, Colonel Mansour gives his presentation, we're going to have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joel Rayburn, um, who's long been a friend of the New America Foundation. Uh, who will sort of uh, produce some responses to what Colonel Mansour says. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rayburn is writing an operational study, leading an operational study of the Iraq War for the U.S. Army. Uh, he is also uh, studying for his PhD at Texas A&M University. His PhD concerns the British experience in Iraq, which I think is probably worse than the American experience in Iraq, uh, I hope. Um, and. Um, and we're really pleased to have both of you here. Uh, so welcome to both of you. Colonel Mansour is going to give his presentation from the podium uh, now. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Well, thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate uh, the New America Foundation sponsoring uh, this talk. Uh, I was not going to write this book. I retired from the military in 2008. and. Although I knew that uh, there was a story to be told there, I was going to let it take some time to, di to uh, digest and develop. And I was thinking maybe 10, 20 years down the road, I would write uh, a, a history of the Iraq War. But a couple years later, in the summer of 2010, I was at a conference with a veritable who's who of counterinsurgency experts in the United States. And we were talking about what to do in Iraq. Uh, of course, the Iraq War, or I'm sorry, in uh, Afghanistan. And of course, w what to do in Afghanistan in 2010 was an issue of major concern in the United States. And invariably, the discussion devolved into what had happened in Iraq, especially what had happened during the surge and why uh, ethno-sectarian violence was reduced so much in that period. And in listening to what the various experts had to say, it was clear to me that not one of them had a holistic understanding of the Iraq War, and especially the surge. And right then and there, I decided to put aside uh, the research I was conducting on the liberation of the Philippines in 1944-45, which will be the subject of my next book. Much nicer uh, writing about people who are thoroughly dead and therefore can't uh, disagree with what you have to say about them. Um, and I decided to write this book. So this is three years in the making now, and uh, I uh, understood where the sources were for it since uh, we had developed and collected an archive of documents for General Petraeus while the surge was ongoing with an eye towards history eventually. Those documents went to Central Command and then to the National Defense University, and I'm indebted to the folks there in both those places for declassifying so many of the documents that I used to write this history. It would not have been possible uh, without uh, their assistance. So what went wrong in Iraq, the subject of the first very long chapter in the book? Uh, the Bush administration made some assumptions going into the Iraq war, that it would be a war of liberation, that the Iraqi people by and large would support uh, the, the taking down Saddam Hussein, a, br a very brutal and hated dictator. And that uh, since they would cooperate uh, with the American forces, the government and the infrastructure would largely remain intact. And therefore, the United States didn't need to plan for a long occupation or an extended rehabilitation of the country. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld also looked on Iraq as a laboratory uh, to test his theories and to validate, really, the revolution in military affairs, the idea that high-tech forces with precision guided munitions and robust intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets could collapse an enemy state relatively quickly at the center of gravity, beginning at the center of gravity, and then uh, wind up the war uh, fairly, fairly rapidly and with fewer casualties. And that 
Uh, this was the sort of wave of the future, the revolution in military affairs that the U.S. military was, so, uh, was going to take advantage of. Um, unfortunately, the enemy didn't cooperate. Uh, General, Lieutenant General Scott Wallace, commander of uh, V Corps, as uh, he's marching up country towards Baghdad, his supply lines are being attacked by guerrillas, by the Saddam Fedayeen. And he makes a comment to the press that this is not the enemy we war gamed against. And for his uh, candidness, he was nearly relieved of command. Uh, and this is sort of uh, part and parcel with uh, how the Secretary of Defense and the administration uh, dealt with things that went against their preconceived notions. They simply stuck their head in the sand and said, it's not happening. So when there was uh, evidence that an insurgency was de developing, well, it wasn't an insurgency, it was merely dead enders, the last remnants of the uh, Saddam Hussein administration. And once we got rid of them, then everything would be okay. As late as November 2003, President Bush, in a meeting of the National Security Council, said, don't tell me that there's a, uh, uh, insurgency in Iraq, I'm not there yet. And this in the midst of the first insurgent Ramadan offensive, which my brigade and others in Iraq were busy combating. Um, in addition to these assumptions that were made, which proved uh, incorrect, uh, there were two uh, really key decisions made in the first 10 days of Ambassador L. Paul Bremer III's tenure as head of the Coalition Provisional Authority. He gets to Baghdad in May of 2003 and the first decision he makes is to debathify Iraqi society. Now, some debathification was going to have to take place. If you had lopped off several hundred or maybe up to a thousand of the top Ba'athists, it probably would have been okay. Uh, but instead, uh, Bremer uh, decided to debathify all the way down to the FERCA level or the division level of the Ba'ath party and thereby got rid of not just the top leaders of the Iraqi government, Saddam Hussein, his family, and, and their immediate advisors, but tens of thousands of Iraqis who had joined the Ba'ath Party because it was the only way to get a decent job. So who were these people? They were doctors, lawyers, engineers, university professors, civil servants, all the same people that our own war plans assumed would remain in place to, let, to make sure that Iraq continued to function in the post-war period. And with one stroke of the pen, he got rid of them. Uh, not only that, but since many of these people were Sunni and they were now denied their jobs, pensions, uh, participation in the political life of the country, uh, what they viewed as the desunification of Iraq, uh, he, they started to, uh, instead of agreeing that Saddam Hussein was bad and it was good to get rid of him and, and they would help us with the new Iraq, which I think initially I got that sense being on the ground that some people were willing to give us the benefit of doubt. Instead, we alienated them. And with one stroke of the pen, L. Paul Bremer III created the political basis for the insurgency. The second decision was to disband the Iraqi army, a national institution that had fought for eight years against Iran, many Shia in the Iraqi army. And it wasn't an instrument of regime control the way that the Republican Guard, the Special Republican Guard, the Fadiyin Saddam were. And uh, we had to eliminate those instruments of regime control, but not the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army uh, was uh, an institution that could have been rehabilitated under new leadership and used to help stabilize post-war Iraq. And instead, uh, Bremer uh, disbanded it. Now, in his memoirs, he says, I was just um, acknowledging the obvious because the soldiers had taken off their uniforms and had gone home. But it's a pretty disingenuous statement because they had also, what he doesn't say is they had taken their weapons home with them. And that had we wanted to bring them back and call them back to the colors, we could have. Why do I know this? Because when it was pointed out to Bremer that we had now had several hundred thousand armed young men without jobs on the street, he decided that we would offer them back pay and that they could come and collect their back pay and a stipend and, uh, and that would give them something with which to start their new lives. They all showed up. It would have been very easy to have a recruiting table right there saying, you want to continue your job, you want to help guard your country, prevent the looting, and so forth. And we wouldn't have gotten them all, all of them, but we would have gotten a significant portion, and we wouldn't have had to start uh, to recreate the Iraqi security forces out of whole cloth. What this did, 
has not only put hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of armed young men on the streets, but tens of thousands of officers. Now, most of them were Sunni, and they were denied their jobs, their pensions, uh, political future, and most importantly in Iraqi society, they were deprived of their honor. And many of these officers decided at that point to take their not inconsiderable military talents with them into the insurgency. And with a second stroke of the pen, L. Paul Bremer III created the military basis for the insurgency. And we capped off these two disastrous decisions by empowering a highly sectarian group of Iraqi politicians, the Iraqi Governing Council, 24 of them, um, and they proceeded to divide up the Iraqi government among themselves. There weren't 24 ministries. They actually had to create three new ministries so that each member of the council could have a ministry he could control. And then he, they proceeded to fire everyone in there who wasn't a member of their particular political party and then packed the, the ministries with their political adherents to give them jobs. And what little comp competence had remained in the Iraqi government was uh, done away with. Uh, by this decision. Uh, so these were the, this set the political basis for uh, the, the downturn in Iraq. I think that it's my contention we created the mess. We created it first by an ill-considered invasion, but then by our decisions in the immediate post-war period. Um, I love Gary Larson. This is uh, the American generals in Iraq. I guess that would be Tommy Franks. Uh, planning out their campaign in, on the calendar, as you notice, every day says kill something and eat it. But it really <laughs> says something about the American army in, uh, in the beginning of the war. It was very offensively <laughs> focused, it was very tactically and, and operationally excellent, and it did know a lot about counterinsurgency. And so the idea that you'd go out and kill and capture insurgent terrorist operatives and it would be raids after raids after raids, and uh, not a lot of thought putting into uh, the other aspects of counterinsurgency that we eventually became very good at, but not in 2003. The, um, so, what, so we were there now, and things were spiraling downward, although not rapidly. Um, what were we going to do? Well, that was a, a good question, and I don't think we had a good answer to it. Uh, we lacked a strategy to guide the way forward, and down at the troop level, I know I was a brigade commander in that first year, we lacked an operational concept that drove operations of each unit in Iraq in a uh, uniform and coherent manner. And we lacked enough resources, we certainly lacked uh, troop strength on the ground. Um, even though, even with these uh, headwinds, there was uh, some good things that were done. Unit by unit, there was a lot of learning that went on. And I think the Army history of the first stage of the Iraq War covers this pretty well. Uh, but it was a uh, hit or miss. It depended up upon the unit commander. And there was a lot of learning when a unit came into Iraq, and then by the time they, they left, uh, they were trained up, and they were pretty, pretty good. But then new units came in, and, and you had that learning process all over again. Uh, even so, there were some successes, but we failed to capitalize on them. Uh, we killed Uday and Kuse Hussein. We defeated that first Ramadan offensive in October, November 2003. Right after that, we captured Saddam Hussein. And these three events in succession really took the wind out of the sails of the very early Ba'athist-led insurgency. And I, it's my contention that had we reached out to the Sunnis at this point with a reform of the Ba'athification decree, and some other political outreach um, that we could have brought them back into support of a way forward. The period from January to March of 2004 was fairly peaceful. There was a downturn in security incidents in Iraq, uh, but we didn't take advantage of it. Uh, instead, we created a transitional administrative law that was crafted uh, really without a lot of Sunni input, and uh, therefore they resisted it. Uh, this period ended with the April 2004 uprisings in Fallujah and across south-central Iraq. Uh, uprisings that were, uh, in the case of the south-central Iraq, was put down by the 1st Armored Division, the unit which I was, of which I was brigade commander. And um, uh, we dealt the Jaysh al-Mahdi, the Mahdi army, uh, a fairly significant blow. In Fallujah, the Marines were on the way to dealing a blow to the insurgents, 
uh, when they were told to stop because uh, the press, especially the Arab press, was firmly against what was happening and there was a lot of misinformation about civilian casualties and so forth. And when they were ordered to stop, then uh, the situation in Fallujah spiraled downward. And in fact, the insurgents ended up uh, seizing the city and holding it until the second uh, Battle of Fallujah in November 2004, which uh, killed 2,000 insurgents and destroyed about a third to a half of the city in the process. Um, we didn't take advantage of the uh, opportunities that we had there in the spring of 2004 uh, for military success on the battlefield. Instead, we withdrew from the cities and we uh, withdrew our forces from their bases inside Baghdad and other cities and put them on the periphery. I know in Baghdad, we went to four major forward operating bases on the periphery of the city. Uh, this was a major mistake. And it was predicated on General John Abizade's belief, he was head of U.S. Central Command, his belief that we were a virus that had infected Iraqi society. And the longer that we were positioned among the Iraqis in their cities, the more antibodies in the form of insurgents we would create. That we were the problem. It wasn't the Iraqis. Um, and when the problem is, is when we withdrew from the cities, no matter how many mounted patrols we launched from those forward operating bases, we could not control the neighborhoods from the periphery. And the result is that the people with the power who were positioned locally uh, rose up then and began to control the urban terrain of Iraq. And that was increasingly the insurgency and uh, the Shia militias that were gaining in strength and power. Um, a real study in contrast, again, showing how different units had different approaches to counterinsurgency. I've described one approach, and that was the massive invasion of Fallujah in 2004. Another approach was H.R. Uh, McMaster's approach with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, Ca Cavalry Regiment up in Tel Afer in 2005. Faced with a similar problem, insurgents that controlled the center of the city, he didn't attack it. Instead, he surrounded it, he isolated it, and then slowly, bit by bit, he cleared it. And then to hold it, he positioned his forces and Iraqi police and army inside the city in smaller combat outposts to make sure that the uh, insurgents could not rise up again and control the terrain. And by doing this, he substantially altered the dynamic of the, of the battle in, in uh, Tal Afar. Um, it was a great example of counterinsurgency warfare, but it was just one unit among many. Uh, nevertheless, it was pretty clear that attacking Iraqi cities to save them was not the answer. And Fallujah, the Second Battle of Fallujah, was the end of that, what I call the kinetic road. Um, this period of the war spiraling downward, but um, not at a crisis point, ended in February of 2006 with the destruction of the al Askari Shrine in Samarra, probably the fourth holiest shrine in, in Shia Islam. Um, up to this point, the Shia had been uh, fairly responsive to calls to, uh, to not make the situation worse. Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani understood that the Shia of Iraq outnumbered the other ethnicities and therefore they could outvote everyone else and they would eventually gain power in, uh, in Iraq. But after this incident, with this major shrine now destroyed, Sistani said if the, if the, if the government, if the Iraqi security forces can't defend our religion, the faithful will. And that was all that the Jaysh al-Mahdi needed to rise up and begin sectarian cleansing in Baghdad and elsewhere. They torched Sunni mosques, they invaded Sunni neighborhoods, kidnapped, tortured, and killed Sunnis, and drove them out of their homes. And this uh, campaign that began in February 2006 gained a force and strength throughout the year. Um, in the western part of Iraq, Al-Qaeda, was gaining control of Al Anbar province. This according to the intelligence report of a Marine colonel who said, we're no longer in control of Al Anbar, Al Qaeda is. But even then, there's a glimmer of hope in the city of Ramadi, and we'll talk about that later. Um, nevertheless, by December 2006, more than 3,500 Iraqis were being killed every month due to ethno sectarian violence. The problem is that multinational force Iraq failed to adjust its strategic uh, 
approach, which was focused on killing and capturing insurgent and terrorist operatives and on a rapid transition of security responsibilities to Iraqi security forces, forces that were fundamentally unready to accept those responsibilities in most cases, and in some cases, especially in terms of the Iraqi National Police, were complicit in the sectarian violence that was ongoing. Um, part of the problem in multinational force Iraq is they simply didn't understand what was going on on the ground. I know this because I, I got a hold of General Casey's documents as well as General Petraeus's. And if you look at the campaign plan review in April of 2006, and this is now two months after the Al-Asghari shrine bombing, it's, it has a list of wild cards, things that could go wrong. And on that list of wild cards is Sunni terrorists destroy a major Shia shrine, thereby sparking sectarian violence throughout Iraq. And it's like, glad it happened two months ago. And you're now you're still putting it in your plan, not as uh, a fact on the ground, but something that could happen. Um, it's just an unwillingness to recognize uh, the reality of what was happening. Um, this shows what was happening. The civilian deaths, the purple is Iraqi data plus coalition data, the, the blue is just coalition data. Obviously the Iraqis are in more places than we are, so they count more bodies. But you can see this trend upward throughout 2006 of the number of civilians dying. And by December, it had reached critical proportions. This would be equivalent to more than 35,000 U.S. citizens dying every month to ethno-sectarian violence. A uh, pretty significant number. And, um, and here is where uh, we are as the surge is announced. We don't understand that this is going to happen. All we can see is that this is happening. And if that's a stock, stock chart, you're a buyer. Oops. What did I just do? There we go. Um, this shows, in geographical terms, uh, what was happening. The darker uh, orange areas are areas where insurgents and terrorists uh, have more sway. And you can see that the, uh, the Tigris River Valley, the, uh, the Euphrates River Valley, and of course por portions of Baghdad are uh, significant concentrations of insurgent terrorist forces. Um, it was a fairly significant uh, challenge. By late summer of 2006, it was clear that the United States was headed for defeat. Um, we put it, I was on the Council of Colonels that worked for the Joint Chiefs, and we put it to them this way. We are not winning, so we are losing, and time is not on our side. Um, parallel strategic reviews were undertaken by the National Security Council, the Joint Chiefs, the State Department. Um, but to his credit, President Bush is the one who made the decision to surge. You know, victory has a thousand fathers and everyone has been writing saying, oh, it was really General Odierno, no, it was really General Keene, no, it was really David Petraeus. Well, guess what? It was President Bush. He's the one that decided to surge against every political headwind blowing against him to include members of his own party saying, get out. Uh, but more important than the surge was how those forces would be used in accordance with the, the new counterinsurgency doctrine that was published in December 2006. So what was the surge? Well, first it was the provision of more forces that enabled a change in the strategic ap approach. But more importantly, again, the movement of those forces back off those big bases, positioning them within the communities that they would protect. That protecting the Iraqi population from ethno-sectarian violence was the only way to drive down that violence and thereby uh, enable politics, at least the politics that doesn't use bombs and bullets as its grammar, uh, to move forward. The Iraqis surged along with us. We added 20 to 30,000 troops to the mix they added 135,000 troops during the same time period. Increasingly, those forces were better trained as our advisory effort took hold. Uh, more importantly, or as importantly, they were partnered with U.S. forces side by side so that they could model their behavior after that of the disciplined U.S. troops. And U.S. troops could keep an eye on the Iraqi security forces to moderate their baser instincts. 
Uh, we improved techniques of population control, blast barriers, uh, segmented Baghdad into a number of uh, isolated uh, or rather gated communities. We used biometric scanners to figure out who belonged in neighborhoods and who was planting the IEDs and so forth. There was better synergy between conventional and special operations forces rather than being two separate elements on the same battle space. They were now working better together. We finally had enough forces to pursue the enemy throughout the breadth and depth of Iraq and to eliminate the safe havens that had cropped up in the previous three years of, of the war. We created a force strategic engagement cell to seek out opportunities to cleave off portions of the insurgency and the Shia militias and bring them into support of the government. Because you can never defeat them all. If you have to fight them all and, and beat them all, that's a pretty tall order, especially in a virulent insurgency such as that which we faced. Uh, there was learning and adapting going on, but now it was more systematic. And because you had a counterinsurgency doctrine that everyone had to follow, you had two leaders in General Odierno and General Petraeus who mandated that the entire force operate under the same doctrine. It wasn't the hit or miss affair that it had been since 2003. And finally, we revamped our detention procedures to make sure that the jihadists didn't control the inside of the detention facilities and that they weren't simply turned into jihadist universities. So what did the surge do? Uh, it acted as a catalyst to uh, impel a lot of other factors that were uh, taking place. The most important of which was the tribal rebellion against Al-Qaeda, which began in Ramadi. Uh, surge wasn't ca the cause of the tribal rebellion. It predated the surge by several months. But the surge was the reason that the awakening spread as rapidly and as fast as it did. What most people don't know, and which I catalog in my book, is General Petraeus went to Ramadi the week after he took command. And he saw what was going on, and he ordered all of his subordinate commanders to support the awakening with all the forces and tools at their disposal. And this is what allowed the awakening to take off. Absent the surge, the awakening, in my bel belief, is confined to Ramadi, and maybe, maybe uh, Al Anbar province at most. But given the, the force of the surge and General Petraeus's orders, it expands well beyond that and becomes a major factor in the defeat of Al Qaeda. The creation of the Sons of Iraq program, that was clearly part of the surge. Uh, these were armed neighborhood watch units that reported to US uh, military leaders. General Petraeus create, uh, learned about uh, one such uh, opportunity in Amaria, and when he learned about that, he basically, in his usual manner, said, this is a great idea. We're going to implement it throughout multinational force Iraq. Um, and so as these insurgent and uh, various militias came in and offered to secure their own communities because they were tired of the, of the depredations on their communities by other folks, we would bring them into a coherent chain of command. We would make them wear a Geneva Convention compliant uniform. And um, only later did we agree to pay them. Uh, and we did this to prevent backsliding to make sure that they wouldn't uh, turn back uh, to the people who could outbid us. Uh, the Jay Shomadi ceasefire in August of 2007 would never have been declared or uh, accepted had the surge not already improved security dramatically in the country. And finally, the Iraqi government's willingness to confront the Jaysh al-Mahdi in Basra and Sadr City and Amara would not have been accomplished or attempted had the surge not uh, provided the wherewithal and, uh, again, the environment in which uh, Muriel Maliki felt emboldened enough to do it. So I'm going to cover real quickly 10 myths of the surge, and I'll end with these 10 myths, and then we'll have some conversation. Um, the first myth, myth is that the change in counterinsurgency doctrine did not matter. That U.S. forces had already adapted to the environment. Um, and in any case, security was already improving in Iraq. Well, I think this is patently false. The counterinsurgency manual that was produced and published in December 2006 finally put a uniform stamp on the operational construct and the tactics used by U.S. forces in Iraq. Before then, it had been very hit or miss. And as far as security being good uh, before the surge, or I'm sorry, um, that the um, violence had already ebbed. Well, here's a graph of the violent incidents in Iraq. 
laser pointer's not working. But you can see that um, as the surge begins in January of 2007, the number of incidents is, is at an all-time high, and it remains high for several months. It isn't until June of 2007, Operation Phantom Thunder and the surge of offensive operations, after all the surge troops are finally on, their, on, on the ground, does violence begin to ebb and ebb substantially. So you can see right here, and then right here, how it drops. But the surge begins right here. So violence had not uh, ebbed. Myth number two, it the awakening was the real reason for the improvement in security. Well, it was a huge reason. Here's General Petraeus with Sheikh Sadr, uh, one of the pr uh, primary sheikhs involved in the awakening, right out of central casting of Lawrence of Arabia. Um, and I think I described this, it's General Petraeus's push that he gave to the awakening uh, that really allowed it to expand beyond the confines of Ramadi. Myth number three, all we did was put the insurgents on our payroll. Well, I think I've already addressed this. Uh, there's their Geneva Con Convention compliant uniforms, by the way. The mm. orange road guard vests uh, works for me. Um, <laughs> by the way, we only paid them $16 million a month, and that's cheap at about five times the price, given the amount of security they gave to their local communities. Uh, at, at their height, there's 103,000 of these sons of Iraq. That's 103,000 light infantrymen that we added to our force structure for a fraction of the cost of putting U.S. forces on the ground. Uh, myth number four, uh, the surge wasn't a strategic shift. It was merely a tactical adaptation that did little to change the situation on the ground. Well, it was a strategic shift. Here's the, if, if strategy is the application of ways and means to achieve an end, here's the ways and the means that were uh, adjusted during the surge. In the middle of this diagram is everything Al-Qaeda needs to uh, survive, and on the outside is everything we did to counter that. And that is a significant amount of, uh, of actions, and it's not all just tactical adaptations on the ground. Uh, General Petraeus called this the Anaconda Plan after the Civil War Plan of the same name. And in terms of ends, this was, uh, there was a change in that as well. The ultimate goal was still a representative Iraq, a democratic Iraq that uh, could be a U.S. ally in the heart of the Middle East, an ally on the, against the war on terror. But in the near term, what we decided is that sustainable security was probably the best we were going to do, and that we'd knit together local initiatives and eventually get to a long-term situation where reconciliation was uh, possible. Myth number five, the surge was merely a hearts and minds campaign. Well, if that's the case, then why is the first six months of the surge the deadliest period of the war for U.S. forces? The fact is that this was not a campaign to win hearts and minds. This was a campaign to control and protect the population in order to defeat the insurgency. And there was a heck of a lot of fighting involved. Myth number six, uh, sectarian cleansing in Baghdad had already stabilized the city uh, prior to the surge. Well, here's a map of the ethno-sectarian violence. The, the more orange the blob, the, the more violence there is. And at the beginning of the surge in January of 2007, there's a heck of a lot of ethno-sectarian violence. Sectarian, sectarian cleansing had not solved the problem. By July 2008, when the surge ends, there is uh, no violence to speak of, ethno-sectarian violence to speak of. And, uh, and thus, my contention, it's the surge that caused the ethno-sectarian violence to ebb. Myth number seven, the Jay el Mahdi ceasefire of 2007 was the real reason for the improvement in security. I've already covered this. Here's Muqtada el Sadr. Again, he would not have offered a ceasefire had the surge not already improved security. Myth number eight, General George Casey's strategy of accelerating transition to the Iraqi security forces could have achieved the same outcome as the surge had we given it more time. Well, this is a quote right from General Casey's own Joint Campaign Progress Review, the last one conducted under his watch, which he signed. And it basically says, we are losing. Uh, many of the risks identified in the campaign plan have materialized. The assumptions did not hold. We are failing to achieve our objectives. Um, 
we need to protect the Iraqi population from sectarian violence. Well, yes, true. Uh, so he didn't believe that his strategy was succeeding, and ne neither did the folks that worked on the creation of the surge. And the Iraq Study Group report, we're caught in a mission that has no foreseeable end. And at that point in time, unfortunately, they were right. The myth number nine, the real reason for the improvement in security was the improvement in capabilities of special operations forces. This is what Bob Woodward contends in his book, The War Within. <coughs> General McChrystal would disagree with this. I know General Petraeus disagrees with this. It was the synergy between the conventional and the special operations forces, the conventional forces taking and holding ground, and the special operations forces then being able to target insurgent and terrorist operatives that created the dynamic uh, that improved, uh, helped to improve the situation on the ground. If you have a pure counter-terrorist campaign and a virulent insurgency such as that that existed in Iraq, there's no way that it can uh, solve the problem. And the final myth, all the surge did was create a decent interval for the orderly withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq. That's all it was designed to do. Well, that's not what it was designed to do. That may be the way it turned out, perhaps. We'll see. Uh, but this goes to the perspective of two presidents. George Bush looked on uh, Iraq as, and his model would have been South Korea, where U.S. forces now 60 years on are still there helping that country stabilized after a very difficult war. Um, South Korea wasn't South Korea for several decades. It only became a vibrant democracy with a vibrant economy several decades after the end of the Korean War. But President Bush wasn't able to see this through to uh, its end. President Obama was elected on an anti-war platform and his vision of Iraq, in my view, was more of that of Vietnam an unwinnable quagmire that U.S. troops needed to get out of as soon as they could and allow the locals on the ground to sort it out among themselves. And unfortunately, um, by removing U.S. forces, in my view, it removed the glue that was holding the security situation together. And when you remove that glue, uh, then the political dynamics that we had helped to tamp down raised their ugly heads again. Um, and it has to do a lot with uh, how we handled the election of 2010, which I won't get into. But the situation now, unfortunately, is spiraling back downhill, and it remains to be seen uh, what is the future end of the war in Iraq. And that's it. Um, there I am watching General Petraeus is back, and uh, I'd be happy to <laughs> have a conversation now. Thank you, Colonel Vance. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Rayburn. <coughs> right. Well, thank you, for, uh, uh, Colonel Mensler, for those remarks. Uh, and and uh, my thanks to everyone who's here today. Um, and uh, it was just slightly over seven years ago that uh, walking across the deserted food court of the Pentagon City <laughs> Mall the night after General Petraeus's confirmation hearings before he went out to Baghdad, that then Colonel Mansour, who was on the phone to someone, motioned me to walk over to him as I was heading to the metro and said, CG wants you to come out to Iraq. <laughs> so, and so began about four solid years of working for with General Petraeus. Um, there are some themes that, uh, uh, that you've talked about today, some themes that you cover in Surge that I'd like to, uh, to tease out a little more fully um, and maybe open uh, a little more ground for, for discussion. Uh, reading Surge with military eyes, first, as someone who was there, just a, a, a smaller cog in the machine, <laughs> um, it, it was a reminder of just uh, how much activity, the level of very complex activity uh, was going on in the headquarters in Iraq um, at, at, at the different levels, at the force level, at the core level. Um, liaison to the U.S. Embassy, liaison to the Iraqi government, to the United Nations, and, and so on. It's an amazingly um, uh, complex landscape that General Petraeus and General Odierno and Ambassador Crocker have to, have to manage and synchronize, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. 
And, and, and so it's the, it, it, if, uh, among other things, your book reminds us of the complexity of an endeavor like that. But reading it with military eyes, it also reads like a cookbook to me because every few pages, uh, as I turn every few pages, I'm reminded of, ah, yes, the strategic uh, counterinsurgency command has to be prepared to deal with this particular kind of problem. And it has to fulfill this kind of role. It has to execute this kind of responsibility. And, and it's dozens of different uh, strategic functions um, that have not yet been captured in military doctrine. Uh, and I think it, it, it would be important for us to, to take a book like yours and to begin the process of getting it into military doctrine so that we don't have to relearn this uh, every time we do um, a major contingency campaign in some foreign country, um, which as, as little as we would want it to happen, um, it's, it's certain to happen again at some point in time. And I hope we're better prepared, I hope we're better equipped uh, so that we can have the knowledge of how um, a counterinsurgency command like MNFI, Multinational Force Iraq, and the U.S. mission in Iraq worked uh, so that we can, have, we can be in, in a more advantageous starting point the next time we have to do this, this kind of thing. And it, it's also a reminder as you flip through the pages with military eyes of the different levers that a strategic commander like General Petraeus uh, has to pull so that he has an operations command which is doing tactical oper overseeing tactical operations on a day-to-day -day basis and he has a train and equip command under uh, Lieutenant General Jim Dubik which is generating those 135,000 Iraqi forces that you mentioned uh, um, uh, joined us on the battlefield during the course of the surge. There's a detention command that is trying to do count what General Petraeus termed counterinsurgency inside the wire so that no longer are your detention centers uh, for the insurgency terrorist academies, but you're actually using intelligence to map out the insurgent networks inside, inside the detention command so that you can have an effect on those that are still out on the battlefield. And on and on and on. There are, there are so many different functional levers that the strategic and the operational commanders have to pull. Um, and, and the ability uh, to synchronize all of those is, is a rare trait, I would say. In a, in a strategic and operational leader. And luckily we had two in General Petraeus and General Odierno who could, who could pull that off. Um, now, uh, a lot of those levers did not exist uh, early on in, in the war. And a lot of those functional commands were not present early in the war. Um, so it's really only, I, I would argue, as you get into the latter stages of General Casey's um, tenure in command and General Petraeus' tenure in command, General Petraeus had to create some of his own levers. General Odierno had to create some of his own levers in order to have those, those tools to fully address the complexity of the problem. And this goes, to, uh, this goes to a second theme that I'd like to touch upon, which is, could you pick the surge up from 2007 and 8 and put it down some other point in the war? Could you, could you have done in 2003 what was done in 2007 and 8? Could you have done it earlier uh, if you, could you have fully exploited uh, the opportunities uh, in, that might have existed in 2003, 4, 5, and 6 in the way that they were exploited in 2007 and 8. And there, there are some precursors for the surge that, that I'd argue unfortunately weren't present uh, earlier in the war. Um, the first is that there's a change in Secretary of Defense in, uh, in December of 2006. And it's a sea change between Secretary Rumsfeld and Secretary Gates. And, and I think uh, senior military leaders of the time uh, would say that the surge probably couldn't have taken place on, uh, without that change. Secondly, um, one of the things that you get in the pages of Surge or that you get in the pages of Michael Gordon's book, The End Game, and some others, is uh, an, a near encyclopedic knowledge of Iraqi politics, Iraqi society, Iraqi culture and the interrelationships of the various political factions, ethnic and, and sectarian groups. And it, it tells you, it shows just how little we knew about Iraq, that Iraq was such a black box to us in 2003 when the invasion took place. And it was a very, it was a very hard learning process. It was one that we unfortunately had to pay for in blood between 2003 and 2006 just to get the knowledge to, so that you'd know. Uh, for example, that, uh, that Abu Risha in Ramadi uh, 
is, is, is a sheikh, or as you put it, he's a minor sheikh of a minor tribe, but he's stepping into a larger role. Why? Because the, the major sheikhs have fled uh, from Al-Qaeda pressure, and they're now in Amman, Jordan. We, I mean, would we have known that kind of thing in, in 2003? I mean, the, 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 level, the level of knowledge that you had to gain to be able to, to, be able to, to see where the seams were that you could exploit is extraordinary. Um, one of the things also, uh, let's say um, in your opening chapter where you describe what went before the surge, um, the, major, uh, the major development that's missed, I think, in the, in the campaign, uh, the campaign as it's planned for in 2004 to 2006, is the indicators of an emerging ethno-sectarian war. Um, it's, we conceive in 2004, I think, that uh, the, the major problem, there's an insurgent problem and there's a problem of uh, an incapacitated state. So you have to build the capacity of the state to, sol to be able to handle the insurgent problem on its own. But along the way, um, when you get to the point where you're, you're helping to build the capacity of a government that is itself a party in an ethno-sectarian war, then you, have to, then you have to ask whether, uh, whether your strategy isn't defeating itself. And I think that's, that's the point that you come to by the end of 2006. And I think General Casey and Ambassador Khalil Zad, that's, that, that's, the, um, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the major fact that they're confronting. That's the, that's the, the, pulling, out, uh, the pulling the rug out from under the assumptions that underpin their campaign plan of 2004, 5, and 6. You also, I would also uh, um, emphasize one of the points you make is that, uh, that uh, General Petraeus in 2007 codifies and expands to the entirety of, of his command across the country uh, some things that are being learned by trial and error in 2004, 5, and 6 in places like Talaf or, or in, in places like Al Qaim out, out in Anbar. Um, and and uh, as, one, uh, as one former senior um, uh, coalition general officer put it to me uh, more recently that it's the adaptability of those tactical units, U.S. units and some other coalition units in 2003 to 6 uh, that's a process of buying time so that their seniors could eventually do the thinking they should have done in the first place and the codifying that they should have done in the first place. Um, third point I, I'd, I'd make one of the takeaways, I think, from, from your book, Colonel Mansour, um, is that the Iraqis are dealing, the, the nature of the problem that the Iraqis are dealing with is an ethno-sectarian struggle for power and resources, as you would put it, and I would add, in many cases, survival. Um, to fill a vacuum that's created when the Saddam regime disappears, a political vacuum. But they're also dealing with the aftermath of complete state collapse. And it, it's difficult to overstate, I, th I think, the extent to which the disappearance, the collapse of the Iraqi state is a cataclysm uh, in Iraq politically, socially, economically, that touches every Iraqi. And then the, the difficulties that a foreign uh, army has in trying to restore order, to stabilize, um, an environment like that, absent all infrastructure of a modern state, you have a, a modern functioning state whose infrastructure disappears, just is completely gone. Um, it, that, that's something that I think was difficult to appreciate from outside Iraq. But the people who are on the ground, like you in, in Baghdad and in Najaf and later in the surge, can understand what I'm talking about. There were places in West Baghdad in 2007 that I remember seeing well-to-do upper-middle-class neighborhoods um, that had been turned into utter wastelands were separated from the rest of the city, cordoned off by uh, mounds of trash and burnout cars and barbed wire that the residents themselves had put in place um, it, in some sort of you know, post-apocalyptic scene. And, and, and I thought to myself, well, what would Beverly Hills, California look like if you turned off the electricity, if you removed all police, if you picked up no trash, uh, if you had no running water, uh, 
and, did, and had that situation for four years. And that's what parts of Baghdad and other major cities of Iraq looked like. That, that was the extent of, of, of the problem, not an easy problem set. Um, and I'd also say that, the <laughs> d let me, to, to, draw another, uh, to draw another analogy about the, the unnecessary collapse of the state in 2003, or, or let's say the finishing off of the job of collapsing the state in 2003 with the disbanding of the Iraqi army. I think to pronounce the Iraqi army had disbanded itself in the spring of 2003 would be sort of like going to a, an aban a deserted Pentagon on Friday evening and declaring that the Department of Defense had disbanded itself. Hmm. The, they're going to come back. You can order them back to work. And, and that's probably what should have been done, uh, in my opinion. And having said that, let me add that, <laughs> that uh, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the U.S. <laughs> Army or the Department of Defense in any way. This is only my opinion, as I should have prefaced everything that I've said. Um, lastly, uh, uh, to extrapolate from, from your book to the situation today, I think, unfortunately, you give us the key to understanding the violence that's racking Iraq today because the various, uh, the various strategic problems that, that you describe being resolved or at least being tackled in the course of the surge, um, and I'm talking about the awakening and the splitting of the, of the Sunni mainstream away from Al-Qaeda and other insurgents, an elite power sharing pact that takes place amongst the, the, uh, the major political parties, an insulation of Iraq from uh, terrorist sanctuaries in Syria and in Iran, and the containing of the Shia militant groups. All of those things, those are the exact things that have been eroded, that have, that have unraveled to create the situation as, as it stands today. And, and um, unfortunately, if we were to continue on with the violence chart, um, that we would see it creeping back up today to a, probably we're back in 2006 in, in Iraq, probably in the, in, the, in the early part of 2006. And so uh, um, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully some sort of forces will intervene to keep it from, from going to where it was at the end of 2006. Um, because at a certain point it's corrosive and there's nothing to stop it. Um, but uh, 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 you identified very well um, the things that need to be done in Iraq to prevent that kind of outcome and unfortunately um, uh, the, uh, the dynamics are, are moving in the opposite direction now. Thank you Lieutenant Colonel uh, Raymond. Well that, that naturally segues into how you ended your talk so which is, um, is it entirely fair to sort of um, blame the Obama administration for the lack of the deal that, to keep American forces in Iraq. After all, the negotiator was Brett McGurk, who, as you know, played a key role on the Bush NSC. And he obviously made a big effort uh, to try and make it work. And it seemed that the Iraqi parliament was really a problem. Or how would you assess that negotiation? Well, in, in two ways. The first, uh, I'd point out that President Bush personally got involved with uh, discussing negotiations with Prime Minister Maliki, almost on a bi-weekly basis. And President Obama never developed a relationship with him. He, instead, they gave the portfolio to his vice president, who just didn't have the clout. And you know the Iraqis know the difference between a vice president <laughs> and a president. And uh, so they understood where they, st where they stood. But if you backtrack before that, I think, uh, the reason we weren't able to extend the SOFA goes to how we mishandled the outcome of the election of 2010. And what, what just for our audience, what is a SOFA? A uh, status of forces agreement. Meaning? That, that meaning allows U.S. forces to operate in a foreign country. So the election of 2010 was a presidential election in Iraq, and it was won by Ayad Alawi, um, who was a Shia, but he was running for a, in a party that was supported by most of the Sunnis. In, in Iraq, as well as many Shia and non-sectarian uh, people. The, um, we had been telling the Sunnis, just enter the political process, things will be okay, you, your voice will be heard through politics, through the ballot box. Well, they won the election, and was their voice heard? The answer is no. We didn't back the winner of the election. We didn't see if even give him an opportunity to try to form a government. Now he may, it might have failed, but we didn't even allow the process to go to fruition. Instead, our ambassador on the ground said, no, Maliki's our guy, we need to back Maliki. And eventually the deal was cut in Tehran, 
in uh, you know the equivalent of the smoke-filled rooms in in Iran, uh, a deal in which the Jay or the Office of the Martyr Sadr, OMS, the party beholden to McDonald Sadr, supported Maliki for another term, and Alawi was sidelined. And so, what do the Sunnis learn from this? That no matter if we win at the ballot box or not, it doesn't matter because who's going to be the next prime minister is going to be decided in Tehran and maybe Washington. And we're going to be left out of the process. And this is the reason why no one would support uh, the extension of US forces in, in Iraq the next year. Because what good were we? We were, we were supporting the other side. And what was our reasoning? Presumably it wasn't completely irrational when I say, ah, oh, the US government. I, I believe that, they, that he thought that Maliki was a good ally and that he was the best hope for a stable Iraq going forward. I think the best hope for a stable Iraq going forward was a system in which democratic rules and, and rule of law was respected. And it wasn't. And as Colonel uh, Rayburn indicated, you know, we're now back at the situation where we were in 2008 with 8,000 and you know, uh, uh, deaths, civilian deaths every year, and the, the number could go up. Not, not maybe to 35,000 or whatever it was in 2006, but clearly the, it's all going in the wrong direction. What, if anything, can the United States do, uh, in your view, to kind of tampen that down? I don't think we should do anything. I've written an op-ed to this effect that Maliki needs to stew in his own juices for a while until mm -hmm. uh, he reverses the, the political uh, decisions that have su suppressed and alienated the Sunnis in Iraq. Mm. And until he does that, until he agrees to share power, because there was an agreement in 2010 where he would share power and he, he, he didn't abide by it, uh, until he agrees to stop persecuting Sunni politicians, which he's done on a number of occasions, uh, until he, he allows uh, a legitimate protest against his government, then why should we help him with the problem of his own creation? Well, how would you assess the strength uh, and or weaknesses of al-Qaeda in Iraq now? Obviously, it's disturbing to see them back in Fallujah and Ramadi and other places where they were pushed out. Well, clearly they're making a comeback, but the tribes have not aligned with them the way they did before 2006. This is the good news. The tribes know that al-Qaeda, nothing good will come of uh, allying with al-Qaeda again. Mm. So what, what, what's happened is <clears throat> the alliance that we created with the tribes has broken down, but they haven't gone back to supporting al-Qaeda either. They're, they're more on the sidelines or they're fighting for their, themselves, really, survival. I don't think al-Qaeda will ever be able to create a safe haven in western Iraq. They, every time they try to take and hold ground, they position themselves such that they can be combated with conventional military force and defeated. On the other hand, the situation throughout Iraq will continue to spiral downward with car bombs and suicide bombings and political violence until you have, again, this resolution among the elites and buy-in among the elites that the best way forward is a political way forward and not a violent way forward. In your presentation, you were somewhat critical of General Abizaid, uh, who obviously was sitting in Tampa during the war. I mean, is the whole concept of a war uh, that is administered out of CENTCOM, you know, several thousand miles away, does that even make sense? I mean, it, are there some lessons to be learned about how, and it, obviously when Petraeus came in, he had a sort of different level of authority, partly because he was talking to the president all the time. Um, are there any lessons to be learned? And obviously Fel Fel Admiral Fallon, who was in charge of uh, CENTCOM, was trying to sort of undercut him, it seems. Uh, it, it, does that structure make sense? <coughs> Um, it does because Central Command has wider responsibilities. Uh, the problem we had um, in 2004 with General Abizaid and then again during the surge with Admiral Fallon is they should have been focusing on the wider region. Mm -hmm. They had a four-star general in Iraq who could fight the war. And instead it was like magnet balls, like kids playing soccer. Everyone wanted to, to follow the ball and, uh, and they didn't want to look at the wider field. And what we felt Central Command should be doing during the surge is, is looking at, uh, at the, the wider region. Uh, mm -hmm. Do something about the, all of the suicide bombers, for instance, flocking in from all of these Arab countries into Iraq. 
you as the Central Command commander can probably have an influence with those And those it was General Del Daly and uh, Hank uh, Crumpton who really kind of dealt with that from a diplomatic point of view. And General Petraeus actually yeah. uh, ended up uh, doing uh, some interagency video teleconferences to discuss the issue. Mm. Why is the commander in Baghdad doing that? Why shouldn't mm. that be the commander in, in Tampa, who has the time, really, to focus on the wider region? So we felt there was too much emphasis on looking at what we were doing and not enough emphasis on the rest of the region. You know, obviously, uh, the US military has gone through its, uh, major experiences where uh, lessons were unlearned because they were too difficult to kind of process for one region or another. And obviously, Vietnam was the, the big one, which is we're, not gonna, we're never going to do that kind of thing again. Therefore, we don't need to learn about it again. H how is the US military uh, position this time around not to unlearn the lessons, the very hard one lessons that you write about in your book? Yeah. And, how, and how would you assess, I mean, clearly there's an effort underway by people like Lieutenant Colonel Rabin to make sure that the lessons are learned, but what's your assessment? You said that lessons were too difficult to learn, and I would disagree with that right. characterization. Well, I mean, I'm emotionally difficult for some people. Difficult, yeah, yes. that's what I'm saying. Uh, <clears throat> there was unwillingness to yes. learn the lessons because they didn't, we, we like to fight the Normandy invasion right. and the campaign across France and <laughs> Germany. We'd, if we could do that, Every like every, <laughs> every half century, the army would be happy. But those aren't the wars we're, you know, that we've been handed. And we have to learn how to fight the wars that we have to fight. And you know, I agree with Joel. You know, we, none of us want to do a long-term counterinsurgency you know, big unit campaign again. I hope it doesn't happen. Mm. But we, it would be nice to be ready in case it does. Yeah. And uh, I am a little bit encouraged that uh, the Army is undertaking this operational study of the Iraq War while the lessons are still fresh. Uh, it reminds me uh, of the lessons learned out of coming out of World War I, for instance. Mm -hmm. British Army doesn't look at the lessons of World War I for 14 years mm -hmm. after the war. Then they produce the study, and it's too critical of Army performance, so it's suppressed, and they never publish it. Uh, the French Army cherry-picked a couple of battles and they developed their doctrine based on an incomplete view of World War I. Mm. The only army that actually, well the American army does a pretty good job, but the army that really does the best job coming out of World War I is the German army. Mm. 400 officers on a number of committees for two years right after the end of the war study what went on and as a result they create a tactical doctrine that whatever you can say about their strat strategy in World War II, their mm. tactical doctrine was sound and was firmly rooted in, a, in looking at the experience of the past war. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an untrue statement that the militaries that look at the last war are doomed to, to fight the last war and, and aren't ready for the next one. It's when you are able to look at the last war and, um, and get the right context and learn the experiences and understand what went on in the last war that you can then uh, prepare your forces much better for what they might face in the future and this would be the case looking at Iraq and Afghanistan and the lessons they have to offer and Vietnam and the lessons they have to offer if we ever have to do a industrial strength counterinsurgency war again. Just before we open it to the audience, a final question about how you proceeded in terms of the, the research for the book. How, how did you go about it? Um, I what I really needed were the primary source documents that were in General Petraeus' papers at the, at the National Defense University. So a lot of it was uh, requesting declassification of chunks of his archive, uh, which um, you know, thankfully the folks there uh, did, and they did in a timely manner, um, and, and that really helped. Uh, I was able, of course, I had all my contacts with my associates. I had my own notes from the campaign. And then I had all the plethora of published secondary sources that I could look at. So it was really a, sort of an easy research for me. I didn't have to spend extended time in an <laughs> archive somewhere and, and dig through papers because I already knew what, what I was looking for and I knew where it was. And in fact, it ended up being sent to me on a CD. So uh, <laughs> no, no archive time at all. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, if you have a question, can you wait for the mic um, and identify yourself? And we'll take this gentleman here to begin with. Tony Smith. It, it should be on. Yeah. Tony Smith, I'm retired Army like you. Um, on, on your opening slide, in which you look at sort of the overarching reasons for the lack of success, the assumptions that going in, um, are you being a little rough on Jerry Bremer and a little easy on Donald Rumsfeld on the issue of debathification? 
and on the dismantling of the Iraqi army. Uh, having done a couple of tours in the Pentagon, it's inconceivable to me to believe that those decisions were made in isolation from the leaders uh, in the Defense Department. It's a good question, and I think there is probably a good book yet to be written when mm. actually we have some hard and fast facts, but I, I won't hold my breath that they'll ever come out because a lot of people now want to hide what actually occurred. I do know that uh, Ambassador Bremer was the President's representative, and he used to tell Secretary Rumsfeld, I am the President's rep representative. And if he was ordered to do something that he felt was, was not right, he could have gone to the president and said, you know, Secretary Rumsfeld says debathify Iraqi society extensively, uh, a la Nazi Germany, and uh, disband the army, and I think this is a really bad idea. Can we tee this up at least for discussion at the level of the National Security Council? And in fact, President Bush in his memoirs says we should have discussed it in the National Security Council. We didn't, and I take responsibility for that. And we might have come to the same conclusion but at least we would have discussed what could have gone wrong with those decisions. So you might be right, but we don't know. But uh, Bremer, in my view, um, he didn't. He clearly didn't push back at all. Tara Marler in the front here. Thank you, Tara Marler. I'm a research fellow with the National Security Program here, and I'm also at the Aspen Institute. Um, I just have a question in terms of the other myths that you painted. Uh, you never mentioned the population displacement trends that were happening at the time. So after the Samara Mosque bombing in 2006, there was significant uh, removal, displacement both internally and out of the country, and the segregation of populations separate from sectarian deaths. And I mean, I'd argue that A, that was one of the other variables that contributed to some of the drops we saw in violence because the populations were self-segregating themselves and not returning home. So Shias were moving out of mixed neighborhoods into Shia areas, Sunnis were moving out of mixed areas into Sunni areas. So I was wondering if you could comment on that dynamic. And also, I'm not sure I really disagree with the general argument you're making that the surge helped. I just I wonder why you're sticking to such a monocausal story. And I think it's an interesting point about if the surge happened at another point in time without those other variables that you were presenting as myths, would it have been possible? And my take was that all of those other conditions, the awakening, the solder ceasefire, the displacement, the sectarian violence reaching a, a saturation point almost, had to have been there for the surge to have had the impact that it had. So I was just wondering if you could respond to that. Um, on the first one, it, it goes to the slide I showed on sectarian, ethno-sectarian violence during the surge. If it was population displacement that was making matters better, then why was there so much ethno-sectarian violence at the beginning of the surge, and why did it continue? We actually took uh, censuses. Commanders on the ground went door to door and figured out who was living in their neighborhoods. And at least in Baghdad, and this is the only place I have uh, knowledge of uh, in, th in this granularity, there was a lot more uh, mixing of the sex, even as even throughout the surge, even by the end of the surge, than uh, that narrative would have you believe uh, that there was some sort of a clean separation of the population. Um, but that was not what our commanders on the ground were reporting in their in their the censuses that they were taking. That there was still a lot of mixing of the population. Um, I believe it, it wasn't the segregation of the populations, it was the gating of Baghdad into gated communities with these blast barriers and the, the biometric uh, scanners and the security checkpoints that basically stopped Shia militias from preying on Sunnis and uh, likewise made it more difficult for uh, Sunni terrorists to inject car bombs and suicide bombers into uh, Shia neighborhoods. On the other um, point, I would agree with you. I don't think I've presented a monocausal explanation of why the surge succeeded. And in fact, in the book, in the conclusion, I say the surge transplanted to a different time and a different place would not have worked. Hmm. So I, I never make the claim that um, it was the way to go before 2000 and before 2006. Um, and, I, and I fully acknowledge that all of these other factors uh, came into play. Uh, and were extremely important. My point is that the, without the surge, there isn't that catalyst to bring them to fruition. And I, I don't think that Iraq is in a better place 
in 2008 than it was in 2006 had we not surged. In fact, I think absent the surge, Iraq would have split up, broken apart as a country uh, the way it was trending. And just a follow up to that, was it an important signal to the Iraqi population that the United States, and was there a sort of PSYOP sort of kind of, an, not, not, not using that a pejorative term, but simply saying, hey, we're staying? Uh, absolutely. In, in fact, I, I mentioned that, I talk about that in the book, I didn't mention it in the talk, but the psychological impact of, uh, we're not withdrawing, it's not, we're not turning this over, we're here with you partnering to the end. And they take their cue off of what the President of the United States was saying. And when he said basically we're all in, then, um, then that meant something. And it meant something to the Sunni tribes, it meant something to the general population of Iraq, it meant something to the Iraqi political leaders. And going again to why the SOFA wasn't renewed in 2011 when you know, there was no indication that President Obama was all in in Iraq. In right. fact, the portfolio had been turned over to his vice president. And the last picture on the screen is you sitting where, uh, here in Washington behind General Petraeus and Ryan Crocker when they're testifying, I think on September 10th, 2007. Yeah. Uh, tell us the atmosphere of that. I mean, that was probably one of the most important hearings of the post-World War II era. It was, um, it was tense, it was surreal. Uh, you know, there had been the New York Times uh, ad by moveon.org attacking General Petraeus's character and personality, or uh, They ethics. called him General Petraeus. Yes, that he was a mouthpiece for the, the White House. Um, it, was, uh, it was a high stakes two days, and uh, I thought that General Petraeus and General Ambassador Crocker handled themselves marvelously, uh, given the amount of pressure they were under and, and scrutiny. Um, it was a, a wonderful experience. There's an entire chapter in the book that is nothing but that uh, testimony. And um, what were the stakes? I mean, what was the? You know? I, there was a move afoot to force a timeline, a withdrawal timeline on uh, on the administration. And when the, those hearings were over, I knew that the way they had gone, that General Petraeus had, had squashed that, basically. It wasn't necessarily his intent to create a political dynamic, but um, it was certainly the outcome of him giving his forthright testimony of what was happening on the ground. And uh, when, when the hearings ended, I looked at him as we were walking down the corridor, and I said, you just bought us six more months. And um, it was true. This gentleman over here. Uh, my name is Mike Boyce. I was with the Baghdad PRT in January 2007 when uh, General Petraeus and then later Ambassador Crocker showed up. Uh, I'm retired from the Marine Corps, so I have a couple comments. First of all, there was another operational doctrine that was very successful. It's called amphibious warfare uh, that we used after, that we learned from World War I and which was extensively in World War II by the Army. You took all our boats, but we forgave you. Um, the second thing is, um, General Schumacher, I hope you know, goes as an unheralded um, element for your success in Iraq because of the introduction of the, of the brigade modules. is an amazing transformation of how the Army brought in 10 different brigades uh, under General Phil and made them all work together. Uh, I was very, very impressed by that. And I'm just saying that as a, um, as a person you know, who was used to joint task organizations. But uh, the fact that you could have a, almost a core size uh, group of units from different parts of the United States and Europe come together in Baghdad and work almost uh, you know, um, with one focus. That was a significant achievement by the Army, and I commend all of you for doing that. Uh, you did a great job in doing that. Um, what would you say to the State Department? Because one of the things that, remar that I found amazing when I showed up there was that I was part of a Baghdad PRT that was unfunded. So how in the world were we supposed to, to complement, much less supplement, your effort in Baghdad uh, with both lack of funding and, quite honestly, very poor leadership on the part of the State Department. I recognize that that's not their job to do nation building, but they were assigned a significant responsibility. And uh, if it wasn't for the fact that you had SERP funding and other uh, sources of money for them that we could use, we wouldn't have been able to do any kind of work at all. So how would you, given the fact that the uh, Defense Department that has significant resources and the State Department still hasn't figured out how to get to that money through Congress, what would you say to the State Department's role in this kind of warfare and how you could use it to, um, to complement your programs or military programs in this kind of warfare? Well, it was sort of a truism that we, were, uh, we wanted a civilian surge as well as a military surge. 
Uh, we clearly needed the, the capacity that uh, civilians could bring to the counterinsurgency campaign. Um, one of the things that uh, was done during the surge and done very effectively was to give brigade commanders embedded provincial reconstruction teams uh, so that a brigade commander who had resources through the commander's emergency response program had people that could secure uh, civilians, uh, then had embedded capability uh, in his brigade area uh, that helped him with the reconstruction aspect of, uh, of counterinsurgency uh, war fighting. And I, you know it wasn't perfect. And did we get as many civilians as we needed? No. In fact, a lot of the PRTs were retired military, as you, you know, and thank you for your service, by the way. Um, I'm not sure how to do this better other than uh, you take an agency like the U.S. Agency for International Development and you put it on steroids. It was uh, much, much larger than it is today during the Vietnam conflict, for instance, and was much of a, more of a force during Vietnam as a result in the CORDS program. Um, I don't see that happening. There's no really political uh, energy to, to, to give the State Department more resources in that regard because, again, most people don't think we're going to fight a war like this again. Hmm. And maybe in our lifetimes we won't. But it certainly would be nice to create that capability or at least have it in germination and be able to ramp it up uh, when needed. Um, but anyway, uh, you're right. Uh, I would say, though, that the civilian capacities that the State Department brought were absolutely critical. Uh, I point to the, um, the introduction of the new currency in Iraq, which would, could, could not have happened without the Treasury Department officials that, that made it happen. And it worked wonderfully to stabilize the Iraqi dinar. And the military didn't have that kind of capability. So um, State Department folks and the broader civilian capacities really crucial. Uh, they weren't perfect, but they were desperately needed. We have a few more uh, minutes left, so let's gather some questions together because Colonel Mansour has to leave uh, after, he, after he does his book signing. Yeah, Andy Pinell, Department of State, retired. Uh, there's an old saying at State that you make policy by, by your personnel policy. It, it, could we have picked better? You, you went through all the mistakes that were made early by but the general sent by Ambassador Bremer. Could we have picked better people at the beginning and avoided those mistakes? Or did people like uh, Petraeus and Crocker came along later learn from those mistakes and that's why they were so good later? Good question. Okay, now, and gentleman in front of you. Uh, Sarang Hamasaid from the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, uh, I, I have a comment, but I'll probably ask it later. But the question is, if you advise uh, counterparts in the Iraqi army today, the, the uh, people who are involved in the, the violence in Anbar and Mosul, what would you advise them from the lessons that you have applied? Okay. Thank you. And the lady behind you. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Margaret Polsky, George Mason University. I'm an analyst and a war gamer. I appreciate very much what both of you are trying to do and the importance of it. I think that your presentations underscore two problems. One is a policy-making problem, and the other is a planning problem. And I wonder if you could talk about the role of your organizations in better informing the policy decisions that were made at the outset to even go into the war. Because as we know, there, were war ga there was war gaming that was done in the 90s that did a pretty good job of anticipating the kinds of problems that would arise from an invasion in Iraq. And, and then secondly, once a, uh, so infor better informing the policy making process and then uh, the planning process itself. Okay. Okay, and then one final question in back. I'll be ready with that. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was no. admiring your memory. Yeah, Colonel Mansour, my name is Phil Carrada from uh, retired State Department. And I want to ask you about uh, that uh, map of President Bush and his commitment to uh, South Korea and o Obama to uh, uh, Vietnam. Well, uh, a big rationale for maintaining a 60-70 year occupation of South Korea was the defense of Japan. Is there a parallel strategic rationale for maintaining a 60-70 year uh, occupation of Iraq? Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so we'll begin with the, the great man theory, that if we just had better people in place, that things would have uh, gone more smoothly. Uh, and I, I, I reject that notion. Now, we didn't have the right people in charge, I believe, in 2003 at either the military or the political level. Uh, but we also didn't have the right organization. Uh, we had um, the most junior three-star in the United States Army with uh, an organization that was not designed um, to conduct theater responsibilities as well as operational responsibilities. And it wasn't until the spring of 2004 that we had a four-star command and a three-star command side by side and the division of those responsibilities. It was, it was too much for any one person to handle, to be able to focus on uh, countering a, a, a budding insurgency and dealing with the political military interface in both Baghdad and Washington at the same time. Uh, you could have had the best person you can imagine and that he wouldn't have been able to complete that job. Now, in terms of um, had, say, Ambassador Crocker been in Ambassador Bremer's position in 2003, would things have gone better? Gone better? Possibly. I think in, in my view, uh, that w that's a better um, analogy. The problem is that he's still, he would still have to have worked for Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> who uh, isn't going to allow him a lot of leeway and uh, is going to steer things in a certain direction. As we, as we know, as the previous uh, question indicated, you know, didn't Secretary Rumsfeld want debathification to occur and didn't want and wanted the army to be disbanded. And is, isn't this just like uh, Germany in 1945, which was the, the vision they had, which was an inaccurate historical analogy. And so I'm not sure that better people would have resulted in a better outcome. I, uh, but you know, that's the fun thing about history. We don't know. Uh, the second one was lessons, um, to, lessons to, well, the big lesson uh, is really a political one. The, problems that Iraq is facing today in Anbar are a result of political impasse at the highest level. And if you can get over the political impasse and, and bring in all sects and ethnicities and factions and parties into a political way forward, then dealing with the, the military aspects of countering terrorism in Anbar will be easy. Uh, but uh, the provision of specific tactics, techniques, procedures, Apache helicopters, Hellfire missiles, uh, that's all noise. You know, you can plink away at these terrorists all day long, but they will continue to rear their ugly heads until the root causes of the problem are addressed and the root causes are political. So that would be my, uh, and unfortunately that advice has to go to the top, <laughs> to the prime minister. And then policy making, um yeah, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting that a lot of people say, boy, I wish the military had intervened and, and give them a piece of their mind. I think, now I haven't studied the, the run-up to the war with primary sources, but in reading all that I've read, I think the military bought in to uh, what was being espoused by Secretary Rumsfeld. Um, Yes, there were plans on the, on the shelf at CENTCOM that said we needed 300,000 troops and so forth, but that was under a different CENTCOM commander. The current CENTCOM commander, Tommy Franks, he was all in. He was, he was okay with, with... So I think that the military did give their best advice, and it wasn't very good advice. <laughs> I think the, the, the bigger issue to me is how can we train and educate our leaders such that when they pin on four stars, they give better advice. And this goes to the professional military education system in this country and the need to have very rigorous, extensive uh, professional military education that counts in an officer's career and isn't sort of a way station between assignments. And final, South Korea, Iraq. We're still in South Korea. Oh, the, the, the need to defend Japan. Well, I, you know, I give you a strategic reason for having a, a strong ally in Iraq, and that's that the Middle East has a lot of oil and it is going to have a lot of oil for decades to come. And I know we all love green energy, but for decades to come, we are going to de be dependent on hydrocarbons to fuel the world's economy. And therefore, the Middle East is going to matter and continue to matter. So when you fly back to Ohio very shortly, you're not going to take an electric plane? Uh, 
<laughs> and Ohio's becoming a, uh, the new Saudi Arabia. We got shale oil <laughs> deposits in southeastern Ohio. So we're well, good. On that note, thank you very much. Uh, and thank, thank you very much, Colonel Raven. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh,